Well, good morning and welcome to Elevenses. Uh, it's what is it? It's Sunday, isn't it? It's the 9th of August. Um, we're well into yet another month of uh, strange times. Um, what have I got for you today in terms of stories? Um, a couple of interesting ones, I hope. Um, we have some news about UK bike sales and how they continue to show some uh, growth. Uh, Sturgis is going ahead this weekend, and there are big questions being asked about whether it will be a super spreader event. Um, I will be talking briefly about how my new video debrief works that uh, I finish off a course with now. Um, we'll be looking at uh, some new KTMs, uh, 250 Duke and 250 Adventure, which may be coming to these shores with a bit of luck. And uh, we'll finish off with a, a tip on better biking. Don't know, don't go is the uh, the phrase there. Um, so, okay, pull up a chair, grab, uh, grab yourself a biscuit and a brew, and uh, stay with me for the next 15 or so minutes. Uh, don't forget, if you have anything to say about anything that I'm commenting on, uh, drop me a line. I'll get back to you at the end of the show. Um, so, all right. Um, Bike sales on the up uh, in July, um, but hardly a tremendous success. Now, if there's one thing that the motorcycle industry is pretty good at, it's um, turning a sales year into what sounds like a silk purse. This year has not surprisingly been a pretty wretched year for anybody involved in the motorcycle industry. Uh, my own income from bike training has been slashed due to three months of enforced lockdown during some of the finest biking weather we've had for years. And it's very unlikely I'll get anywhere near my normal level of income by the end of the year. Um, so the same is going to apply to bike shops generally, as well as, as, well as all the loss of uh, in-shop sales of clothing and accessories. Um, tires won't have worn out, brake pads won't have worn out, people won't be buying bits and pieces for their bikes because uh, they haven't used them very much. Uh, sales of motorcycles are down 16% year on year, even if the figures for July are up significantly over last year. But you wouldn't believe that from reading the MCI press release, which states that building on the tremendous sales success, uh, sales growth seen in June, the motorcycle uh, sales and scooters continued their relentless upward trend in July. Well, relentless, yeah. Okay, that's uh, only if you think about what went on in March, April, and May. Um, so not surprisingly, when you think about the circumstances, uh, most of the upward growth is also at the smaller CC end of the market, uh, which is the less profitable end, of course, for the bike dealers. Um, so it's in the 125s and the 126 to 650 categories. Also, interestingly, in the other category, uh, which includes electric motorcycles, which currently the MCIA doesn't count independently. Again, it's not too surprising that with the current log jam in direct access, um, that many training schools are, where they're reporting they can't get sufficient bike tests, or in some cases they can't get any tests at all, that uh, it seems that record numbers of riders are heading to try to get a CBT as a way at least to getting onto a small CC commuter bike. And it's worth pointing out that as well as a uh, 125 up to the usual uh, 11 kilowatt limit, uh, you can also ride an electric motorcycle with, uh, or scooter with an 11 kilowatt output. So in July, uh, 5,371 new commuter type powered, powered two wheelers were registered, and that is up a massive 62% on the same figure last year. Best-selling bikes, PCX125 Scooter, CB125F Honda, 
both of those. Um, the interesting bike in the mix there was a Royal Enfield Interceptor 650, which also sold pretty well. Um, that bike's been getting some good reviews, I've noticed. Um, but it's, you know, it's a long way to go before we can honestly start to talk about this being a good year for the motorcycle industry. So I think, you know, the MCIA, they're getting a bit ahead of themselves. <clears throat> okay, still to come, I'll talk very briefly about my uh, video debriefs, how I finish off a course uh, under my new uh, socially distanced training. And we'll be looking at the KTM Duke 250, and it's an adventure bike uh, sister and we'll finish off with a better biking tip at the end of the show as well but uh, first of all over to the US where motorcycling is hitting the headlines once again but uh, once again it's not for a particularly good reason this is the time of the Sturgis annual rally in South Dakota and uh, it's anticipated around a quarter of a million owners are going to turn up this year it's a 10-day bit affair um, Normally, um, about twice that number puts in an appearance, but it's still going to be amongst the uh, US's biggest public gatherings since coronavirus first appeared in the spring. Uh, why is the rally so important? Well, because basically it generates around $800 million in the town, and it's taken place every year since 1938, so there's quite a tradition behind it as well. And the result is that RVs, bikers, classic cars, and all have been converging on a town of 7,000 people. Uh, the governor, Christy Nome, who's a Republican, encouraged people to attend the rally in an interview on Fox News on Wednesday night. But her, her views seem to be somewhat at odds to local residents. In a city-sponsored survey, uh, nearly 60%, uh, sorry, more than 60% of nearly 7,000 residents favoured postponing the event. Um, the event has therefore gone ahead. Guidelines from the Centre for D Disease Control and Prevention um, don't suggest any kind of specific number of attendees for these events, but what they do do is encourage organisers um, to maintain what they call the capacity conducive to reducing the spread of the virus. The agency also asks that people socially distance at six feet apart, which as you probably remember is just under two metres, and to wear face masks. And they say that attendees will be asked to be respectful of the community concerns by practising social distancing and taking personal responsibility for their health by following these guidelines. Yet the rally has gone ahead, according to newspaper reports on both sides of the Atlantic, with little regard for this public health emergency that has been uh, hitting the world. And fears are that the rally could prove to be a super spreader event um, with a lot of transmission between people attending the event and then taking that back to their own communities. But the, that worry doesn't seem to have stopped any riders from attending. Uh, one headline uh, uh, online uh, read, many bikes, few masks, and showed a picture of a crowded street uh, hundreds of bikes being ridden up and down the street uh, past the sidewalks which were rammed full of people uh, with no social distancing going on and hardly a face covering in sight. South Dakota is actually one of the states in the US that didn't put anybody on lockdown and uh, it doesn't require masks to be worn either. Um, so there are fewer restrictions in South Dakota at the moment than many of the riders would be experiencing at home. And, although, you know, although it's generally accepted that coronavirus is less likely to spread when outdoors, um, it, it still does depend on wearing masks and social distancing. And, of course, the whole draw of the town is all the activities which go on indoors in the restaurants, the stores which sell, special, you know, tourist goods and all the rest of it, the campgrounds where events are put on. Um, it seems a few businesses have put up signs limiting the number of people who can enter at any one time, but most haven't bothered. Um, yeah, so, okay, what will happen there will be interesting to see. I dare say that some people will be studying the results of that right now. Uh, just a reminder, you are watching Elevens is Live with Kevin Williams of Survival Skills Rider Training. Um, we're here on Wednesdays and Sundays with the show, 15 minutes of better biking 
uh, topical news, controversial views. Uh, do join me again on Wednesday. Um, now, I said I would give you just a quick overview of the video debrief that I do. Now, normally when I finish a course, what I do is I have a quick 10 minute chat or so at the end of the session. I don't make it a long one because people are tired after the ride. And then I go back and I write a written debrief and send that off uh, a few days later in the mail. Um, but um, with the social distancing issues, I've cut down the contact time actually on the road. And one of the things I've cut out is as much of the chit chat that we would normally do as possible. Um, and so I've put the, this debrief online and we've been using Zoom. And the idea is that uh, we can go over particular parts of the ride. Uh, we can cover particular bits of theory. And the great thing is that most people who've done this so far have come back with some very, very positive feedback about how effective it is. One of the comments, for example, was that um, having gone home and had time to think about what they'd done on the training course, they had time to formulate some questions to come up with some things that they wanted me to answer for them, um, which is great. Um, the other comment that um, I've had from a couple of people is that it's much more relaxed because they're not having to listen uh, over the noise of traffic. They're not standing in the open or even sitting at a, a sort of table outside a a cafe or something. Um, they're in their own home, they've got their own cup of tea, um, they're relaxed, uh, they've got over the tiredness of the course, and they're in a much more receptive frame of mind to deal with it. Um, that was a, a comment from somebody who's actually done other training. So they have a, a reference, uh, as it were, to compare it with. So um, the video debrief um, also allows me to use the video clips that I uh, take from the on bike camera and to go over specific issues in some detail, something I can't do so easily at the end of the course. And even if I write it up in a sort of word picture, it's not nearly so easy to do. Um, so basically, um, the, there are a lot of positives for the video debrief. Don't let the idea that uh, I'm doing some of my training now online and on Zoom put you off. Um, the feedback has been universally positive about these changes, and I don't think anybody has so far felt shortchanged in as much as the actual time we're on the road uh, is shorter than normal, because what I'm doing is not cutting down our riding time uh, specifically, I'm cutting down the talking time from the time we are actually together. And so that's how I compact the time on the road, not by reducing the distance we travel. And if you want to do a couple of extra hours of riding on the road, I'm more than happy to accommodate you on that as well for a bargain £75. So do have a look at my courses. I've got the price down to £160 at the moment. I won't hold it there forever. I will put it up again, I'm, af I'm afraid. Um, but you are getting uh, something around about four and a half, five hours of contact time with the briefings and uh, the on-road riding. So, okay, that's a little bit about my training courses. Um, don't forget, uh, we're here with the show every Wednesday and Sunday at 11. Uh, you can catch up with the show here. You can uh, find the videos over on YouTube as well, where you will also find my 60 Second Safety series, which is going up as well, meaning uh, more, more of those appearing. One's gone up uh, this week. So, okay, very quickly, uh, what's going on with KTM? Well, as you may remember, back in 2012, seems uh, only yesterday to me, they launched a range of single-cylinder bikes, inexpensive 125, 200, and 390 Dukes, all of which were built in India. Um, clearly, the 125 could be ridden on L plates. The 390 was A2 license compliant. Um, but that left the 200, it's sitting in a bit of a marketing hole in the UK. So although the 200 has always been a popular entry-level bike over in Asia, uh, it was largely overlooked here in the West and particularly in the UK. And it wasn't long till it was discontinued. But times change and inexpensive bikes, as we've just seen, are suddenly in demand. Uh, KTM uh, fully expect that the, uh, the two-wheel market will continue to thrive thanks to the pandemic. And so uh, the addition of a model that's even more affordable than the 390, but more uh, powerful than the 125, could be a strategic decision to try to seduce a tier of the population that otherwise wouldn't consider 
the motorcycle because of the costs. Um, over in the US, it seems that the Duke 200 could be on the way in, as that particular model has now been certified by the California Air Resources Board uh, with the 2020 model. Um, and that could be a way that the uh, KTM will use up some of the older machines because the 200 has been replaced uh, with a 250. Um, now, the 250 uh, is, uh, again, single-cylinder liquid-cooled engine, and it complies with the latest uh, very tough Indian emission rules. Um, you may think that anything goes in India, but it doesn't. They have some of the toughest emission regulations in the world to try to clean up their air over there. So if it meets Indian rules, it should meet all European um, standards. Um, pumps out a fairly respectable 29.6 brake horsepower at 9,000 RPM, 24 Newton meters of torque at 7,500, six-speed gearbox. Um, the bike borrows its styling from the uh, 390. Um, I was going to show you the, um, the picture of it, actually. Let me just uh, bring that back up. Um, should have done this a moment ago, but uh, there we go. That's um, the 390. That's the two. Uh, that's the baby Duke. Um, so it gets the 390s LED headlight, uh, so it gives it the more of the family look. Uh, as you can see, it's got the standard sort of package upside down front fork, single monoshock LED lights. Uh, it's got dual channel ABS and uh, an instrument cluster. But unlike the 390, you don't get Bluetooth connectivity. Um, okay, so obviously that is a naked machine. Uh, not everybody wants to ride one of those. So something that um, has been added to the KTM range is the Adventure bike. Um, and this is the 250 Adventure, which has been seen out on Indian roads. Now, it's known this bike has been coming. Um, the latest spy shots suggest it is road ready and it's likely to appear anytime soon. It was um, officially going to be launched earlier this year, but the COVID crisis put it all on the back burner. But now re uh, production's resumed out in India. Uh, it's likely to be in the showroom soon. It'll be interesting to see if it makes it to the UK because it is obviously a wallet-friendly machine. And uh, whilst 30 horsepower doesn't sound much, it's pretty much what the old 250RD LC used to pump out. So that should be enough to push the KTMs up to uh, sort of three-figure speeds or thereabouts anyway. <coughs> and that should give you plenty of oomph for motorway and fast road I road riding. Um, last thing on the list, um, if you enjoy the show, uh, don't forget you can come over to my coffee page and uh, support me over there. Um, buying me a coffee for as little as three pounds gets you a month's access to well over a hundred art better biking articles. More are going up all the time. Support me at three pounds a month and you get access to special uh, other content too, including some uh, thinking about my performance bends course. And I just want to finish off very quickly um, by talking about the um, something that I popped up yesterday on my skills on Saturday uh, LM, uh, item over on the Facebook page. Um, go over there and have a look at it if you like. But basically what happened was to describe very quickly, I was overtaken by a motorcycle while I was out on Dartmoor and I could see why the rider had overtaken there because it was something that in the past I've done myself. You could see the road coming down the hill on the far side. You could see that road was completely clear. We'd had a view of it for a good 20 or 30 seconds. There was clearly nothing between us and the far crest even in the hidden dip that was in front of us. And therein lies the problem, because whatever is in that dip, we don't know. We simply do not know what's there. We were, we're guessing um, that we're not seeing a car actually pulling away from the side of the road. Or what do you expect to find on Dartmoor? Well, sheep are a fairly obvious hazard. There are sheep all over the place on Dartmoor. And one thing I did notice this year is they seem to be a lot less worried about traffic than normal. Uh, they were wandering into the road uh, with gay abandon. Um, just after the rider passed us and drove, rode over the top into the blind crest, um, he was correct. There wasn't any oncoming traffic. Nobody was pulling away from the blind area in the bottom of the dip. But between the f him passing 
uh, us and the car in front. Um, we had to stop very abruptly indeed when two ponies ambled out from the side of the road. Um, you know, the question is, would he have been able to stop mid overtake if he, those ponies had been just 20 seconds or so earlier moving into the road? So remember dead ground. Uh, any blind area that you can't see in creates what's called a surprise horizon. And if you cannot see into it, then expect nasty surprises. In this case, the um, problem being the the pony so okay don't forget if you are looking to get back to biking uh, drop me a line come and have a look at my web page uh, see what i'm doing in terms of new training um, i'm running my back to biking courses i'm also running my ride uh, ride to work ride for fun courses um, you can learn about urban riding you can learn more about what's going on out in the open roads and I'm also offering online video coaching for those who can't reach or possibly can't afford a full on course. Uh, so do come over and have a look at what I'm offering. There's plenty to think about with survival skills. So if you've enjoyed the show, as I said, do give me a thought to uh, supporting us and uh, hopefully see you again on Wednesday. So that's uh, Kevin Williams signing off now. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the show. Bye for now.